Our first speaker is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Zoology in the Institute of Arts and Sciences in Far Eastern University. Also finished his Doctor of Medicine in Far Eastern University, Nika Reyes Medical Foundation. Also uh, finished his Master in Hospital Administration in the College of Public Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. He finished his postgraduate training in the National Institute of Health Advanced Biosafety Officers Training Course at the U.S. Department of State and UP Manila. He received various awards, and to name a few, he is a recipient of the 2016 Biosafety Hero awarded by the International Federation of Biosafety Association based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Professional Certification in Biorisk Management granted by the International Federation of Biosafety Association in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in April 2017. Six Sigma Yellow Belt cert Certification granted by the St. Luke's Medical Center on October 19, 2017, Bonifacio Global City, Taguig, Manila. Professional Certification in Biosecurity granted by the International Federation of Biosafety Association in Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in November 2017. He is a member of the Department of Health, Health Facility Development Bureau Committee on Laboratory Services, Safety, Research and Ethics in January 2018. The founding president of Biorisk Association of the Philippines in 2015, Biosafety Officer at St. Luke's Medical Center, Philippines, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about transitioning the laboratory biorisk management framework through ISO 35001. Please help me welcome our first plenary lecturer, Dr. Miguel Martin Noble Moreno II. Thank you. A pleasant good evening, Pamet Southern Luzon. I hope you are all safe and comfortable in the confines of your home with your family. First, I would like to thank uh, Pamet National, uh, headed by your president, Mr. Ronnie Puno, for having biosafety, bio risk management, and biosecurity in the agenda most of the time. Secondly, to Professor Oliver Dumawal for inviting me to this regional conference. To host chapter, Sir Juven Peña Florida. I'd like also to say thank you to Dr. Roberto Padua for his very uh, comprehensive lecture. Uh, also to the national officers of PAMET, uh, the chapter presidents, and of course to you PAMET members for embracing the science of biosafety, biosecurity, and virus management. That is why you all are the last of the frontliners to, to be affected by the virus, because you were aware you are prepared. In my, it is my pleasure to address you again on your annual regional conference. I remember the last time was in Daet, in our, and this is now our new setup being virtual. I hope the message my lecture sends you will be concrete and remembered when you switch off your gadgets after the virtual conference. I take pride in presenting to you a more detailed lecture of my initial introduction to the ISO 35001 version 2019, uh, which I gave at the North Luzon Regional Conference sometime summer last year. My very first encounter with the standard was in February 2019 when the VRAP vice president and myself, plus the two members, uh, three members, two of which are veterinarians, we attended the US Department of Agriculture International Biosafety and Biocontainment Symposium in Baltimore, Maryland, where they introduced the newest standard of the ISO. It was a four day symposium, mainly focused on biosecurity of valuable biologic materials especially the zoonotics. There was a lecture there on introduction to the new ISO standard for bio-risk management for laboratories and other related organizations. Of course, following the vision and mission of BRAP, I wanted to bring this home to the Philippines and have BRAP and PAMET again in the front, in the front line of bio-risk management. I immediately looked for that session in Baltimore and I attended, attended it listening attentively. The initial discussions were on bio-risk management and you all know about that because bio-risk management is the back, 
is the backbone of this new standard. So let's review a little about bio-risk management. As we all know, bio-risk covers both biosafety and biosecurity, where the identified hazards are the biological agents and their products. In bio-risk management, we establish and implement systems and policies in order to manage this laboratory bio-risk. And bio-risk management should be integral in the day-to-day -day operations of the laboratory, both in normal time and in times of emergencies, such as the pandemic. So what were we following before the ISO? This is the history of the CEN issuances. CEN is European Committee for Standardization. Uh, it is CEN because the original name is in French. And an output of the uh, CEN is called a working agreement. So we call it a CWA, meaning CEN working agreement. It is by definition, not an official standard from the member organizations. Take note that CWA does not have the status of the European standard, and it involves no obligation at the national level. To give you a detailed overview, let me briefly discuss CWA issuances concerned with the biomedical laboratory and bio-risk management. So let's go to the first, which is CWA 15.7.9.2. You all remember this, CWI 15.7.9.3. We have all used this from uh, 2008, and this is what we were following. It's the most famous CWA we have encountered all through these years. Remember that, CWA 15.7.9.3. It, it is a laboratory bio-risk management standard, which was written in 2007 and then adopted in 2008. The development of CWA 15793 involved 76 participants from 24 European countries. They convened and wrote and finalized the draft and its distribution was funded by the European Commission. It lasted for three years, yun yung kanyang lifespan, after being released in 2008 and was superseded by the 2011 version whose distribution was made avail available by uh, Health Canada. We used this until 2019 when the ISO finally made its grand entrance as being the new standard for bio-risk management. Leaving the 15793, we go into the 16393 of 2012. What's important in this document? It it presents guidelines for the implementation of the CWA 15793 version 2008 and eventually 2011. So if your organization accepted the CWA as its bio-risk management standard to follow, you need this document to help to, uh, to be as your guide to help you in its implementation. Other documents is so the CWA 16335 of 2011 uh, this one describes competence uh, in the areas of, bio, of a biosafety professional, international, national, national or regional regulations or directives take precedence over the CWA. The, uh, the 16335 provides in informative annexes and model role profile and model, model tasks of a biosafety professional in an organization. This helps to define competence requirements. It also provides a model training specifications for reaching competence. The BIRA, BIRA has adopted this uh, and we started it on pilot basis in Mindanao and it's doing good, but I will tell you uh, another news later on. Uh, that, that, uh, 16335 intends to provide a framework for those who work in the biosafety and biosecurity fields. Uh, so those who are interested in pursuing a career in biosafety, this one is used to evaluate your competence as a professional and, and to identify areas for development in yourself and in your organization. 
in the context of this document, biosecurity is restricted to laboratory biosecurity on also. Kasi merong field biosecurity. This one is for the laboratory only. There is a move now. This is the, uh, the good news. There is a move now to convert the CEN workshop uh, 1655, this one, by ISO again and make it into a biosafety professional competency standard. So masipag silang gumawa ngayon ng mga standards nila. Uh, this, so this is how it looks. I'm sorry, I didn't re realize it will be this small. So it, the document covers a scope, informative references, of course, abbreviations always, role of the BSP in an organization, and by safety professional background qualifications and competencies. Tapos all the annexes will uh, describe the, the coverage of the document. So we are using now the CWA 15793, the 2011 version, because the 2008 version expired after three years. It, because it has a limited uh, lifespan of up to six years. We use this standard just to keep our laboratory safe and secure until the public showed that there was still a need for a new laboratory bio risk management. So if you count uh, 2011 plus six years, the total lifespan of the CWA, it expires in 2017. Several major biosafety organizations and countries from all regions have confirmed the need to convert the CWA 15793 into a suitable guidance document. So as early as 2014, the ISO took on the task to standardize bio-risk management. And on 2017, in its last year of existence, they started drafting the new standard. So the new standard is what we call now your ISO 35001 series of 2019. Uh, ISO started working to develop the new standard by 2014, and then they drafted it in 2017, and they wanted it to be consistent with other ISO management standards such as ISO 14001 and 54001, which are all risk managements for different uh, specialties. Out of the 163 member countries, each one had to vote and decide for issues. Even if there was just one vote that didn't uh, approve the ISO, they would deliberate on that. So this is a very uh, well-discussed document and it is now the standard for bio-risk management in laboratories and other uh, organizations. Uh, these, are the, these are the pictures of the uh, committee, the technical working group who was tasked with the creation of the ISO 35001-2019. Uh, this came out November 2019. So what is the ISO 35001-2019? It's a newly created standard. It was released and its official name is Bio Risk Management for Laboratories and Other Related Organizations. So it's not confined just to the laboratory per se, but also to organizations who, like DRAP and PAMET, uh, push for the, bio, for the bio risk management of laboratories. So, what is this standard all about? We have uh, four uh, specific reasons why the ISO was created. It responds to a need in the market. As we said earlier, ISO does not decide when to develop a standard. They simply respond to the industry's call or need for a, stand, for a standard. So the, country, the laboratory uh, talks to the ISO in the country, the ISO leader in the country, and then the ISO uh, Stakeholder in the country communicates with the ISO in head, uh, general headquarters in uh, Europe. Second, ISO standards are based on global expert opinion. So it's not just written by a few people in, in Europe. 
if you remember, I said there were 160 participants from 64 countries all over the world. So that's the coverage. The experts creating the standard negotiate and all aspects which include scope, uh, key definitions and content are discussed. The third is the standards are developed through a multi-stakeholder process, which means the technical committees are made up of experts from the concerned industry, which is by safety, by security, and by risk management. And they form consumer associations. Uh, and from consumer associations, the academe, NGOs, and government. And the fourth is, uh, uh, these standards are, a deliberate, are deliberated upon and check on a consensus-based approach, taking into consideration all of the stakeholders' comments. As I said, just one uh, stakeholder who does not conform to the standard, they will deliberate on that until it is finally decided upon. So what is the ISO 35001? It's actually a bio risk management system itself. Uh, what's beautiful is now we have a real standard that all we need to do is just follow it. So always remember that whenever we say bio risk, we refer, we always refer to both biosafety and biosecurity. The bio risk management system presented here is based on a management system approach, which enables an organization to effectively identify, assess, control and evaluate the biosafety and biosecurity risks inherent in, in its activities inside the laboratory. As such, this document is intended to provide require, to define requirements for a bio-risk management system that is appropriate to the nature and scale of any organization. The bio-risk management system is built on the concept of continual improvement through a cycle of planning, implementing, reviewing, and improving the process and actions that an organization undertakes to meet its goals. You have heard this, I'm sure. This is known as the PDCA principle, the plan, do, check, and act principle. If we look at the uh, ISO 35001 quality management system approach, imagine you are looking at the pyramid and you are on top, uh, a drone, a drone view. This is the top, top to down pyramid view of a bio-risk management system. Model lifted from the first few pages of ISO 35001. You will need to exercise uh, a little constructive imagination here and see this figure from the top like viewing, as, as I said, the top of a pyramid. You know, when I was creating this uh, this lecture, I was I am I was really very careful because the ISO thirty five zero zero one is a copyrighted material, and when you talk about copyright in Europe, it is very strict. They send you only one copy through uh, electronic, and that that electronic file is tagged. It, whenever you put it on the internet, it tells the ISO office where it is. If that file becomes two, they also know where it is and who started spreading or having the, having the file copied. They are very strict, honestly, I tell you. Uh, therefore, the top, going back to the pyramid, the top most circle is labeled support, which is your admin involvement in the system. Uh, around it, followed by the leadership of the organization taking charge. It's the leader who takes charge of the PDCA process. Next layers going down uh, is 4.3 and 4.4 4 .4 labeled scope of the virus management system. So you have there telling us who is uh, in charge and then what is the scope? What is the coverage? And then followed by its foundation labeled 4.2, understanding the needs and expectations of the interested parties, together with 4.1, understanding the organization and its con content, context. Uh, I hope you are still with me in this uh, pyramid theme. Now, uh, 
this top of the pyramid view of the uh, of the sorry of a by responded species source ayaw gumalaw okay super we superimpose the pyramid on this same figure this is the top down pyramid view of the bio mass, uh, of the bio risk management system model lifted from the first few pages of the ISO 35001 as i said earlier you need uh, i hope your imagination is as vivid as mine you see uh, the arrow leadership surrounded by the pdca and then you have the exter internal external issues intended outcomes of the management system and the needs and expectation of the interested party, which comprises all your, the context of your organization. So when you, when you start implementing the ISO 35001 in your organization, you will have to do this initially. So what is the PDA, PDCA cycle? I'm sure many of you know this already. It's based upon a quality management system framework it is specific for bio-risk management programs that integrate best practices and procedures built around the P PDCA cycle. It all boils down to continual improvement. Uh, these are all for the continual improvement of your laboratory and the entire organization the laboratory belongs to. So the appropriate figure to use to describe the PDCA should be this one. We see the four steps of the process, and at a certain point, it repeatedly, it repeated, it is repeated regularly to achieve the continuous improvement uh, as it is defined. More often than not, the cycle may be repeated twice or thrice, depending if the issue was addressed. So there is one cycle after the other describing. Uh, the, the problem. So you, you plan, you do, you check, and you act. At a certain point, you see it is not yet uh, addressed. So you continue improvement, and then you plan, you do, and you check, and, and you do, you check, and then you act. So here you will see it to repeat the PDCA cycle until you are satisfied with, with your results. This process is called the multi loop. PDCA. So when you have a problem, plan, do, check, and act. It's not solved. You go to number, uh, another PDCA. So you do that many times until it is solved. And then you do a risk assessment again every now and then. So what are the key points uh, of the ISO? It is not a technical document. Uh, well, anyway, the 15790 was not also a technical document. Yeah, it is not intended to replace any national or subnational regulatory requirements that may compliance with, you may apply compliance with regulatory requirement is mandatory. What does it mean? You want to apply ISO 35001, and I'm sure you will do one of these days. Whenever you start looking at the document, the IS, uh, the new standard, you always put the DOH issuances on top of the ISO. So if the ISO tells you this is it and what DOS tells you, there is another way of how we do it in the Philippines, that will be the uh, standard to be followed, the one issued by the Department of Health. So all other um, international, uh, all other international standards and laws are always superseded by the Department of Health issuances. Always remember that. Uh, where can you use ISO? Uh, when you want to improve your overall bio risk uh, performance. It was mentioned by the keynote speaker that it, now in our time, in the new era, you have to do a bio risk management always prior to doing anything in your laboratory. When you need a framework uh, or structure for effective biosafety, biosecurity program manage, you use the ISO 35001. When you want to communicate 
the awareness defined in your organization, you follow the communication process as defined in the ISO 35001. When you need to improve international co collaboration, you also use this one, especially this, the ISO, because in the international arena, this is already the gold standard. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's peek into the contents of the ISO. This is the, this is the part of the lecture which I really had to ask permission. I had to make sure I was not uh, falling into the trap of wanting to disseminate it. Uh, so the ISO 35001 has 10 sections and it's only 26 pages. Yung CWI 15793, 49 pages. Yun. So the 10 sections are here the scope, the normative references, terms and uh, terms and definitions, of course, palaging kasama yan. Uh, context of the organization, which I briefly discussed earlier, the, the, the pyramid, and then it talks about leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, and then improvement. So let's go into the uh, sections one by one. Mabilis lang mo ito. Scope number one. Number one is scope. ISO defines an approach to identify, assess, control, and monitor the risks associated with biological materials. It is applicable to any laboratory or other organization that works with stores, transports, and disposes, and disposes of biological materials. ISO 35001 is not intended for laboratories, remember, which test for presence of microorganisms or toxins in food or feed stuff. It is not intended for management of this form use of genetically modified crops in agriculture. Why? Because there is an ISO specific for uh, these ones. So this one is particularly for uh, the laboratory handling biological materials. So number two, normative references. How lucky are we that there are no normative references for this standard? What are norm norm normative references? Uh, they close lists for information, of their, of the documents which are cited in the text in such a way that some of, or all of their content constitutes requirement for the document. So let's go to the third. Terms and definitions. For the whole 26 pages, there are only 46 defined terms for virus management. And if you go to uh, some of them, you will find out that we've been doing this already from the 15793. So they show their requirements. They talk about the virus management system itself, biological agents, and their bi and versus biological materials, hazards versus risk versus biohazards. Biosafety versus biosecurity versus physical security, uh, reliability and competence, conformity versus non-conformity, incidents versus accidents, corrective and preventive actions, and validation versus verification. How I'd like to discuss this. But I am, it is I, it is not in my power. So next is context of the organization. Look, think back at the pyramid earlier. There are four sections under the context of organizations. Uh, understanding the mission and the vision. Determine interested parties and the requirements. Determine boundaries of virus management, the management system, external and internal issues regarding uh, section one, which is the scope and establish, establish document and implement communication, com, to maintain and continually improve a bio risk management system, which is the most critical, always the bio risk management system. Number five is leadership. So what does it say about leadership? It has three sections, 
first is first section is leadership and commitment. Uh, uh, you need to ensure policy are established and compatible with organization, available resources, communicate importance of system, uh, achieve its goal and outcome, uh, being all well and documented and verified. Yun ang trabaho ng leadership. Second is policy. Top management shall establish bio-risk management systems. They should be made available and communicated to all. It should protect worker and visitor uh, environment contamination, assessing and prioritize, prioritizing risks, reducing biosecurity risks, and the last is roles and responsibilities. Guidance for roles and responsibilities, always following the chain of command. So it is always from number one to number five, never from number five to number one, and never uh, in between. So you have top management, who is supported by senior management. After the senior man management, you have your bio-risk management committee. Committee muna. Before you go to your bio-risk management advisor or your biosafety officer or your biosafety professional, and then you go down now to your diagnostic and scientific management. Number six in the standard is planning. There are uh, two sections under planning. One is action, address, risk, and opportunity. So you identify the, uh, the threat, you do an analysis, and then you do a risk assessment, and then you mitigate on the assessment, and then you check if your mitigation is doing good by doing a performance evaluation. So if not, you go back to number one again, simply the PDCA cycle. Always remember by risk management objectives and planning to achieve them in order to achieve them. The seventh section is your support. It has eight sections. Well, first is resources. When you talk about resources, you should have a worker health program. You should have issues on vaccination of your workers. Second section is competence. Make sure that the people, behavioral factors and worker management are always following the, uh, the competence. As at this point in time, we are still using the uh, CWA uh, standard for competence because uh, ISO has not yet come up with the new standard, ISO standard for competence. And re personnel reliability measures. Then you, third is uh, training and retraining. Retraining for body safety should always be after uh, biennially every two years. And then the fourth is communication. Then you have document information. When you talk about documented information, you have general information, creating and updating your information, control of documents information, and of course, information security. This is more of biosecurity already. And then non-employees. How do you deal with non-employees in your laboratory? Then personal security. And then control of suppliers. Very important. I have seen laboratories, big laboratories of tertiary hospitals where all of a sudden you see somebody inside the lab who is wearing street clothes and, ask, and asking around, asking around. And when I ask around, who was that man? He was, he was a supplier. <laughs> so you need to control that in the ISO standard. Then we talk about operations. This is one of the longest sections. It has, it has eight sections. Operational planning and control. You have to have their policy, which tells you how you are doing it and how are you controlling the risk. Commissioning and decommissioning. It's enough that it's not enough that you hand over a new laboratory to your customer it should be properly commissioned. And when you, are, when you have a laboratory that is already old, dilapidated, and you want to close it down, you have to do a proper decommissioning of that laboratory. Number three, you have maintenance, control, calibration, very, uh, certification, and validation of your equipment. The worst thing you can do is buy a machine and have the seller do the certification. 
you should always have at least a third part, a second party or a third party for certification and validation. And then you talk about physical security in operations. You talk about biological materials and inventory. You talk about good microbiological practices. You know, a basic GMT you all learn in school. Then you, you have you talk about clothing and personnel protective equipment, PPEs and your uniforms. What is the issue now in this? ISO deals with it that you cannot, you should not bring out of the laboratory whatever you're wearing inside. Worse is you don't bring it home for washing. So we talk about the contamination and waste management. And then preparedness, response, and contingency planning. You, talk, you have uh, emergency scenarios, emergency plan training, emergency exercises and simulators. These are what you call your drills. And then you have contingency plans. What is plan A, plan B, plan C, depending on the emergency. And the last one is your transport of biological materials, which is always included in every standard that talks about uh, the laboratory. Nine, performance evaluation. Okay, you did a PDCA. You have mitigated. You are now, you should now do performance and evaluation. What, do, what does it mean? After monitoring, measuring, you analyze and you evaluate. Is it working? Is it good? Or do you have to do another PDCA? You have your internal audit. Better yet, you have an external audit or third party helping you out on this. And then your results are submitted to management review, of course, with your recommendation for proper addressing by the management because they have control of your resources. And the last section is improvement because we talk about PDCA. You, all, you, all, you always have to go into continuous improvement. These sections include the general, uh, incident, nonconformity, and corrective action. And then how will you continually improve this on a regular basis? So those are the, uh, the 10 chapters of the, P, uh, of the ISO 35001 and their corresponding sections. I'm sorry, but uh, that's all, that's, what I can only present to you. So how will you learn about this? You attend more and more uh, trainings on ISO. Not one training will give you the entire ISO in itself. So if you attend many, especially the risk assessment part using the ISO, uh, you will be able to complete <laughs> the, one, the uh, standard in itself. You're supposed to buy the standard. And it's 118 uh, Swiss francs. I think it's around, it's almost uh, $100 or 5,000 pesos just for the 26 pages. Uh, I lifted this from the ISO website, the official name of the standard. It's abstract and the price of, uh, is, for, is for a single use non-copy, non-print, electronic copy of the standard. Napakahigpit nila talaga. So I think that ends my uh, lecture. I'd like to thank again, Sir Oliver, uh, of course, the regional director and the PAMET national president, uh, Sir Ronnie Puno. Uh, my helpers when creating this slide so that I won't be uh, what they call sued for copyright claim. Uh, Ms. Maureen Ellis of the International Federation by Safety Association. Uh, so Dr. Cecilia Williams uh, of San Sandia National Laboratories. Mr. Sean Kaufman, who was my guide in creating, uh, in giving me an outline, my very first outline, which I developed into. And of course, the Pakistan Biological Safety Association for their, for their guide also in presenting this, uh, this standard because they already have presented this. And if they were not sued, I will not be sued also. So with that, good luck. I hope we, we go into the ISO. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, 
uh, I, I don't know if we will be if they will be addressed here, but you can always email me with a BRAP email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Dr. Miguel Martin N. Moreno, the president of the Wireless Associations Association of the Philippines 2015 on the topic, transitioning the laboratory virus management framework through ISO 35001. And uh, with that, um, we'd also like to present uh, an e-certificate to our first plenary lecturer. So once again, this certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Miguel Martin N. Moreno II for his shared invaluable time and expertise as plenary speaker during the PAMET Southern Luzon 2020 Regional E-Conference held online on October 24, 2020. Signed, Mr. Oliver Shane Ardemawal, Regional Director for PAMET Southern Luzon. And of course, PAMET National President, Mr. Ronaldo Ipuno. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Miguel Martin and Moreno II. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much.